there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 1 through 2. <laughs> Put the bottle down before you came up, huh? Yeah, he didn't want anybody to see you. <laughs> Hey, I'm Dave. I pastor this multi-campus church called uh, Yakima Foursquare. Uh, we get to do what I think is one of the funnest things we do as a church, and that is dedicate uh, a little person to the Lord. Uh, this is Brett and Amanda Druffle and their daughter Morgan, or Mo. And uh, really today we get to do two really fun things and then a sad but good thing. Uh, so if you understand how Foursquare operates, you've heard me say this before, but uh, in our tradition, we dedicate our children to the Lord. I anoint uh, both the, the child and, and mom and dad uh, with oil, which is a representation of his spirit, which we think is significant and important. And, uh, and we just pray. The Bible says we're two or more gathered in his name. He's there when we agree upon anything. And I think we all should uh, know this. Uh, and that is that God wants nothing more than this little girl to walk in the fullness of who he created her to be. And that's, in essence, what we're going to pray over her. Uh, and also for the power that these two need uh, to recognize her giftedness and to be great parents to her. Uh, some traditions baptize their infants, and, uh, and uh, that's not wrong and we're right. It's just the traditions that we follow. We hope that at some point uh, Morgan will decide to follow Jesus uh, personally and want to be baptized to make that public declaration. So if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, would you extend your hands towards this family? I got to sneak up on Mo because she saw me coming last time and hid from me. So uh, Lord Jesus, we do. I place this oil on Morgan as a representation of your spirit. Lord, I want this little girl in every way to be filled with your spirit. I want her to recognize and know your voice. I want her to sense uh, very keenly uh, where you're leading and guiding her. I want her to just know where she knows things, uh, that she is a child of God and that she has a purpose in life. And Lord, that she again walks in the fullness of that. Uh, we just pray a hedge of protection around her, uh, Lord, that, uh, again, her life is, is just completely, totally full, uh, as you've promised. And I put this oil on bread. I put this oil on Amanda because, again, in the world that we live in, there are challenges, and they're going to need supernatural insight into who she is and what the world's doing around them, uh, just a sensitivity uh, to what... Uh, needs to happen as, again, they usher uh, this little girl into her future and into adulthood, into her life and ministry. So again, do everything that you need to do in them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank them for being so wise? So now the first fun thing and then the sad but good thing. Uh, the fun thing is that Brett is a part of a farming family in uh, eastern Washington, right close to that incredible town called Pullman, where the finest university in the land is located, Washington State University. And uh, he's going to join his uh, family's business in farming, something he's dreamed about doing. Uh, so that's the fun thing. He's getting to walk into the some of the fun fullness of what he thinks God is doing in his life. Uh, the sad thing is that his wife has decided to go with him. <laughs> We're still ne negotiating over Morgan, whether she gets to go or not. But uh, Amanda, this incredible woman, uh, has been on our staff for over 10 years. She began working uh, here when she was very, very young. Uh, she now leads our family ministries, which is all of our children's and families' work. Uh, she's an incredible leader. I tell her all the time that she could do anything she wants in ministry because she's just that gifted. And again, uh, the sad part is that she's following this guy <laughs> to the other side. Uh, not the dark side, though, because did I tell you Pullman is where Washington State University is? <laughs> anyway, I do all this to make myself laugh so I don't cry um, because I'm going to miss both of them and all of them. But uh, Amanda, thank you so much for all you've done to, to make this place incredible. And she's going to keep doing that from a distance while we try to figure out how to live without her. But uh, the thing that I felt as I began to think about what I was going to say to them, God is always taking us to greener pasture. 
And, uh, and I really believe, actually got a picture in my mind's eye of the grass being so long in this next season of their life that they're almost overwhelmed by how good it is. And, um, and, I, and we believe this too. When we, we send somebody, when we anoint somebody, when they go, then God's going to do something pretty, pretty crazy cool here too. So we're anticipating that. But uh, we want to release them into this next amazing season. So if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, there's never enough oil to put on people. So I'm going to put more oil on them and pray for them. Father, I do put this oil once again on them, but for a new reason. Uh, You have in this next season something absolutely amazing for this family. And uh, I pray in Jesus' name that they realize that, that they see that. Uh, Lord, there are going to be obstacles. There are going to be things that are difficult, but I pray that they won't focus on those, but they'll focus on the things that you have for them in this new season. Uh, You're going to open doors before them that that no one could open but you, and I pray that you just close doors that they're not supposed to walk through, that they'd recognize them, and again, that uh, in this next season, uh, much as I've seen in my mind's eye, that they would experience a time of incredible, incredible blessing and fruitfulness. Uh, That's what you want for all of us. That's what we want for them. So we release them into the fullness of this next season and thank them. We're so very grateful uh, for their time here and their time with us. Uh, Let them know they are deeply, deeply loved by a bunch of people in Yakima, Washington that call Yakima Foursquare their home. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we thank them for their service? (laughs) Am I fine? (laughs) <laughs> We've lost the pacifier. There it is. <laughs> well, while I'm uh, putting my podium up so I can see my notes, I want to tell you a couple of things. That We had a safety forum yesterday, and, and uh, we were just hoping that a couple people would show up, and we had over 300 people uh, in this place. Uh, there's just a real strong commitment in the church to make sure that, uh, that churches are safe places to worship. It's the second most frequented place uh, for bad guys to try to do bad things. And I want you to know that as I listened and as we talked about it, uh, we're doing a lot of things already that make this an incredibly safe place for you to worship. Um, bad guys don't like all the eyes that we have placed out in the parking lot and out in front of buildings and all of that stuff. Uh, so there are a lot of deterrents to that. Uh, But again, we're continuing to evaluate what we're doing because our commitment is that nothing bad would happen in this place. I do want you to know that this would be the safest side of the place to sit on, okay? Uh, All of you sit over here, and the last place to fill up is over here. I just want you to know that's the safest side of the building, so... (laughs) The second thing is that we just wrote another check this week... um, our gift to the world this year was for 141 plus thousand dollars, and uh, yeah. For those of you that don't know what that is, uh, we decided several years ago we wouldn't spend as much on ourselves at Christmas. We'd pool an offering and uh, and we'd do something significant. So we've already uh, written a check that will go to Pakistan for a pastoral training school for a safe house that we're going to build. We've written a check to uh, Foursquare Disaster Relief and their project Nourish, feeding uh, many uh, refugees who are starving to death, Uh, 20 million people in the verge of starvation right now on the earth, most of them refugees. And we just wrote the check this week for our, uh, to the water project, and we're going to build some sand dams and and, uh, rehabilitate some wells, and we're going to work on some springs to make them safe. The number one killer of children under six years old is waterborne disease, and we have significantly uh, been working to make that not true. So thank you, all of you that have made that uh, a reality. I have a friend here, Christina Wagaman. Christina, would you stand up? Yeah, he had no idea I was going to do this. Uh, Christina is the head of all what we call Next Gen Ministries in our district. Uh, I serve on that team with her, uh, just trying to support the churches of our, of our district. And uh, not only is she concentrating on children's and youth ministries, uh, but this fine lady just got herself engaged. So can we... <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, yeah. 
So again, uh, we're in this, I'm shadowing on Sundays what you guys are going through through this Rooted thing. If you're not involved in Rooted yet and you want to get involved, check the connection counter out after service. We could probably sneak you in. As you saw in the opening video, the Romans 8, 1 and 2 is the voice, I mean, is the verse that we're memorizing this week. And, uh, and it talks about freedom. And today I want to really answer, if I can, the question, who is God? Um, that's a hard question. It's a difficult question. And in the first day of reading in our rooted books, it says this, no matter who you, we are or where we come from, we each have an idea about God. It could be you think that he doesn't exist or he just created the world and now sits back and watches it, disinterested. Maybe you think he is a she or an it. Maybe for you, God is the ultimate 911 service, only to be called upon in emergency, or the cosmic police officer waiting and watching to catch you break his laws. We are often, and this is the most important thing I think I'm going to say from this particular piece, we are often inoculated, I love that word, with these images of, uh, images of God early in our lives. And we get those images from our life experience, from our parents, from our culture, and sometimes for, from church. It's called our worldview. It's how we see things. Andy Stanley talked in specifics of the gods that he sees Americans worship. He says one of them is called the bodyguard god who won't let anything bad happen to you. That's our concept of who God is. And this is really a big deal because we run into people all the time who have walked away from God because God, they think, allowed something to happen. I lost somebody I love. Somebody did something uh, in incredibly awful to me. Uh, I mean, all kinds of reasons like that. The bodyguard God would not let that happen. And here's what I want you to know. If you've walked away from that God, it's good because that God doesn't exist. Uh, he talks about Andy Stanley, the boyfriend God, that God's always near. I always have this warm, fuzzy feeling that God is near. He talked about the guilt God who controls us with guilt and fear. If it feels good, then God would say no. Yeah, God, the guilt God loves us, but he doesn't like us. Uh, he talked about the anti-science God who just tells us to quit thinking and believe. And then he talked about the gap God who explains everything in belief. And here's uh, in between. And here's what I want you to understand. If you are worshiping any of those gods as you think about them, I want you to understand you can walk away from those gods because that's not who God is. If you have walked away from Christianity because of something in that that you feel like God has done, that's not good because you've walked away from Jesus. And if you've walked away from Jesus for a reason that isn't real, that's a very bad reason to walk away from Jesus. As we talk about who is God, I want to take you to the book of Ephesians. It's written by Paul to a group of people in a church, in a place called Ephesus, a city. It was a poor metropolitan area. And they responded to the gospel. Paul shows up and starts telling them about Jesus, and they just start responding. I mean, it's crazy. We'd call it revival. But Ephesus is the home of the temple of Artemis. Uh, the Romans called her Diana. Uh, she was the daughter of Zeus, the twin sister of Apollo. Her temple in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was completely constructed with marble, uh, which was the only one of the seven wonders it was. It would just shine in the sunlight. It was 425 feet long, 225 feet wide, 127 columns, all of them 60 feet tall. And there was a statue in there of this goddess Artemis, the goddess of fertility and childbearing and, and hunting. And she was worshipped by everyone all over the Greek world. This was a place of pilgrimage. People came to worship there, to sacrifice in hope that she would respond in particular if it had to do with fertility. This was the place that they came. And again, revival breaks out in this place. And the revival was so powerful when Paul first showed up that they were actually bringing their spell books out, throwing them in a pile, and, and burning them. 
And the silversmiths uh, realized what was happening, and they all got together and with one voice started almost a riot, shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, because they made these little figurines of Artemis, and they recognized and realized they were going to lose their livelihood if they didn't stop what they saw happening. So that's what happened uh, in this. It's all in Acts chapter 19, if you're interested in reading that portion of the story. But as this letter is written later, things have changed from the time when revival was, and, 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 and they were hot after the things of God. The awe and the wonder is gone. And, and I think about that as we wander this thing called Christianity. How many times have we gone through the ups and downs where we just don't feel like God is there anymore or we're just struggling with our faith? The awe and the wonder is gone. Again, in this particular place, all kinds of people are doing all kinds of other things and in particular, still worshiping this fertility goddess that had some pretty crazy stuff that went around. Actually, just about everything that goes around in our culture today. They'd go and beg her for favor. And what happened is the church in this particular community began to superimpose the goddess onto Jesus. So they're beginning to meld some practices diluting true Christianity. And Paul writes them this letter. And here's what I want you to understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to reintroduce them to God. So when we're asking the question, who is God, that's what Paul is trying to explain to them. So read it on the screen behind me as I read out loud. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Notice how it's not partial blessing or a little bit of blessing, but it's every spiritual blessing. But also notice where it comes from. It comes from being in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for the adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So again, recognize it is love inspired. It's not an obligation. God just simply loves in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. I love that word, lavished. Not just a little bit, not just some just to keep you going, but he's just lavishing his grace on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven on earth, and on earth under Christ. That'll make sense as I talk a little bit later. In him we are chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You know, I, let me just cut through it all and tell you what he's really saying. He's saying, you know what? You have just scratched the surface of who this God is. Just scratch the surface. If you didn't catch this, he says three different things to us, and I'll give them to you. He first says, he is the God that chose us. I don't know if you know this, but all of the statues of Zeus have a picture of him with a lightning rod in his hand, just basically communicating, you mess up, I'm going to get you. You mess up. I'm going to get you, which is, again, a picture that we often have of God. Diana, you had to try to get her to turn to see you, to acknowledge you, so that she might, if you do what is necessary, she just might respond to your need and to your prayer. You never knew where you stood with her, with, with Zeus. You didn't know. So you're driven by fear because you just don't know where you stand with these gods that the entire culture was worshiping. And Paul is saying, our God chose us. You never know where you stand with them, but you know where you stand with God because he chose you. 
You are his. He knows your name. As a matter of fact, I'll remind you that he said in that piece of scripture that we've been adopted. And that is beautiful language. He's saying you're in the family now. It's formal. You're part of the family. It's official. He chose you. It says that we are marked with a seal. A deposit of the Holy Spirit is how he described it. It's just like having a signet ring and dropping the wax down and putting it down. Everyone's going to know that you are mine. This is permanent. It won't fade. You're part of a plan, which is, again, a key piece of how we know that we're chosen. He chose us in him before the creation of the world is the way he described it. Talk about taking care of insecurity. He's saying, I knew you before you were even born. I formed you in your mother's womb is what the Bible says about us. Again, that should take care of any insecurities we've had. I've made a plan and I'm working it out in you and through you. And this is one of the places, just a little side note, where Calvinists would say that this indicates that God chose us and it has nothing to do with us. It's God actually choosing us. Armenians believe that, that God chooses everybody, but we as individuals have to make a decision whether or not to follow him. It's we have a part to play. And I want you to know something, and it's interesting. Both of these traditions can build strong cases for why they believe that's what's going on. But I want you to understand something. As a, as a four-square pastor in a four-square church, we believe in the Mar Arminian view. We believe that God chooses everybody, but we have to move towards him. And if you're interested in some interesting reads on that, uh, Harold Eberly's Father, Son, Theo Theology would be a great book for you to read if you're confused about that. And again, I probably shouldn't even have gone in that direction. But it's a big piece of where people get this thinking. Here's what I think Paul wants us to know. He doesn't want us to think about what I've just described to you. Paul wants us to know that we're chosen. As his follower, we are chosen. So who is God? He's the God that chooses you. The second thing that I would tell you, he's a God who is generous to us. Diana, you had to be generous to her. Artemis, you had to be generous to her. Zeus, you had to be generous to him. And they just might reciprocate. But they might not, too. You just never knew. But again, he lavished the riches of his glorious grace on us. And I don't know if you think about that, but what does it mean to have grace lavished on you? And it means that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what your struggles are, he just keeps forgiving and pouring out his grace on you. It never stops. He just lavishes love and grace on you. And for me, I am so incredibly grateful for that. Incredibly grateful. It says that he gathers what is lost, broken, and dismantled and puts it together in Jesus. So again, if you're broken, I want you to understand that his generosity takes care of things. And he said things that we see and things that we don't see. So it might be an inner battle that you're facing. might not be anything physical. It might be something physical. But understand that it's both the seen and the unseen. He is big enough to take care of whatever is broken in you. He pulled it together is how the Greek describes it. He pulls it together into unity. He heals it in Christ. Everything that is fractured is now made whole in Jesus. And he continues. He gives us understanding, the mystery of his will. They were never clear where these other gods stood. They were never clear where they stood with those gods. But this God, Paul is saying, he'll reveal himself. He will track you. He is willing and open to show you who he is. He wants you to know him. I was sitting at the dinner table with my young granddaughter the other day, and she's just as cute as all get out. I'm just one of those silly grandparents like many grandparents. And she blabbered something that I had no idea what it was, but I thought it was cute, so I giggled a little bit. But her mom really started laughing, and I said, what did she say? And she said, well, she just told me, Mom, I'm talking to you, and you're not listening to me. <laughs> she's a little sassy like her grandma. But God is so generous that he reveals himself to us. We don't have to sit and listen to somebody we can't understand. We get into Christ and we understand. So who is God? He is generous. 
And finally, number three, he is a God who purchased us. And this is kind of a strange world, but if you look into the world of kidnapping, you realize that in a kidnapping situation, there's a ransom paid. And that's what this is talking about, that he purchased us, uh, that we've been ransomed. And, and I've, I've realized something as I was walking through this. I'm probably not worth kidnapping. Because if I were, I would have been kidnapped. But I've never been kidnapped. And I've been in lots of places that it would have been really easy to kidnap me. But I've never been kidnapped. And I don't know about if you've got this yet, but you haven't been kidnapped either. Why don't you just turn to the person next to you and say, you, 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 you're not worth it. Understand this. He purchased us. So to him, you are worth so much. And God paid the price because you matter to him. You, you are so significant to him. How did he ransom us? By the blood and death of Jesus. Jesus just literally declared, I'll set them free. I will set them free. And we were stuck in bondage and he paid the price. And why did he do that? Why did he pay the price? Please don't miss this. So that we could be abundantly free. So that we could be abundantly free. You don't have to be that old self. You don't have to be stuck in a bondage. You don't have to be mired in addiction. You don't have to be mired in brokenness. You can be free. You don't have to be full of guilt. You don't have to wonder if you've done enough. You, when you say yes to Jesus, are a son or a daughter of God. You know what, being free is not easy. It's interesting how people who spend a lot of their life in prison, they'll get out and they'll actually begin to do things to get themselves back into that bondage, into that prison. They just don't know how to be free. I watch a lot of Christians walk in just degrees of wholeness, but never really seeking full wholeness. They keep, the whole, keep holding on to things like their old friends or something. They keep grasping on to things that are just destroying them and the people around them, but they just can't let go. They can't be free. And I want you to understand, God did not come so that you could be partially free. He came that you would be abundantly free because he thought you were worth it. He thought you were worth it. I heard this the other day about our worldview as Americans. We as Americans pursue happiness. We don't pursue holiness. We aren't interested in being in Christ. We're interested in being happy. When the only place we will find that freedom and happiness is in Christ. I also read another man who said that we as Americans, we look at the Bible through what he calls a me lens. That we can even read our Bible and the only thing we're interested in is what's in it for me. What's in it for me. And I want you to know something as we answer the question, who is this God? And we look in his book. Please fully and completely understand that this book is about him. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's about him. And when we look to him, that's when we get free. So who is God? He's the God that purchased us. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for what I hope is a very clear picture of who you are. I thank you that Paul made it as clear as he could that you are a God that has chosen us, you are a God that's generous to us, and you are a God that purchased us. And really, all we have to do is say yes and amen, and we're in. So my prayer is that if any of us are struggling 
trying to understand who you are, trying to understand what you think of us, my prayer is that today we would recognize and realize that again, you've chosen us. And that you're just wanting to generously pour your grace upon us. And I pray, Lord, because I know there are people sitting here right now that need a dump truck full of grace dumped on them right now. And I pray that you would do that. Pour that grace on those that need that grace right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for purchasing us. Thank you for saying I'll set them free. You know, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here today and have yet to say yes to Jesus, I hope that you've heard enough to make you discern and determine, I want to say yes to this God that chose me, that is generous to me, and that's purchased me. I'm going to ask you to respond if that's how you feel. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you've never said yes to Jesus and realize right now that you want to say yes to Jesus, would you just lift your hand and say, that's me? I want to say yes to Jesus. I see that little hand. That's so awesome. I see that hand in the back. That's great. Yeah, that's good stuff. God loves, loves, loves when that happens. Well, because we're a family and because maybe you didn't have the courage to raise your hand but want to pray a prayer that opens that door, we're all going to pray this prayer together. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for choosing me. Thank you for forgiving me, for pouring your grace out on me, for setting me free. Thank you for purchasing me. I receive the fullness of all that means right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's applaud with those that made that decision.